So Advent, what does this mean? What does it mean? Well, traditionally, the church has used this time, you know, in the litur- liturgical calendar, things that are in the calendar are things that we're meant to remember that is part of the Christian walk. And one of these is us preparing and waiting for Christ's coming. Now, that sounds weird because he's already come, hasn't he? So that's a weird thing to do. But there's an acknowledgement that these are two worthwhile um, values that it is to be human. It actually, for humans to flourish, we need to get that there's times of preparation and there's times of waiting. Who likes those words? No way. My words are not my favourite list of words, to be honest. Not the type of person that likes to prepare. I like to fly by the seat of my pants. Anyone notice that already about me? <laughs> Slight amusements. Those. I'll prepare if I have to. Does it sound, Rob? Does it sound? Yeah. And waiting. Oh. But there are actually values that rounds us out of what it is to be human. And if we can find the value and the space in that, we'll actually find out more of who we're called to be. Yeah, in preparation can be so worthwhile and helpful. Not to hold on tightly, because some people are the other end of when we talk about preparation. They want to preparate, pre- preparate? Prepare is the word I'm looking for. So much so that they think they can sort it out and think they're thinking they're in control. And that is just as dangerous as the person like me who doesn't want to be at all. Yeah, because they miss the point of preparation. But waiting also, the... the building of anticipation, of understanding something that's worth, things happen in the waiting. Things happen in us in the waiting. Wow. Okay. But with that, there's usually four things that we we look at over over the Advent season. I'm going to chuck them all in together. It's hope, peace, joy, love, and of course, Jesus. So we are preparing and waiting for Jesus, not only has come as we celebrate at Christmas, but is coming. That's a really important part of this process in, in Advent, is our hope and peace are available to us in understanding that Jesus is come and he is coming. Yeah, the now and not yet of that, which is great. I'm going to speak a lot to hope today because... I'm speaking on peace a bit more um, on Christmas Day. So even though we've lit the candles, I'm just letting you know, I'll speak more to peace on Christmas Day. And so I'm going to pick up a bit more about hope. I don't know if you've noticed in this season that this is not just a Christian thing. People who speak as a follower of Jesus, our country loves Christmas. Yeah? Anyone notice this? This isn't just a religious holiday, but there's a lot of people that love this time. I look, only looked yesterday and look out on the street and there's lots of people, whether they have faith or not, I love this time of the year. They care. You know, you only need to know this if you... Who has a Netflix subscription here? Not as many as I thought. Wow. Oh, just people not want to own up to it. That's what it is. Or someone else owns it and you use theirs. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But every year at this time, Raya loves this. See, you're getting used to the sermon. See, already. Raya is a big fan of Christmas and Christmas movies. Netflix released 56 new Christmas movies this year. How is that possible? How many there already are? They're everywhere. Why? They come out again and they make them and recycle all sorts of different um, stories that already happened. Because people love Christmas. I want you to talk to the person next to you (coughs) as I sneeze. (coughs) Excuse me. Um, Talk to the person next to you. Why do you think? Why do you think people love Christmas time? Go in Australia. Talk, talk. I'd like to hear your opinions. Okay. What do you think, guys? What do you think? Why do you think Australians love Christmas? What's that? 
<laughs> hoping for snow. Well, there's no doubt it's hot at that time, isn't it? But I think people do like when the weather gets better. Jackson, why? Presents. presents. Of course. Kids love it because they go, oh, I'm going to get something. Absolutely. There's a bit of excitement and anticipation in that, isn't there? Family. Absolutely. Where the anxiety gets raised in people of some of the family they're going to see or the family that they like, it's going to happen that we're going to spend time with family. And not only that, time set aside. Life stops a little bit. It's crazy up to that moment. But things are meant to stop. You know, Christmas Day, mainly still we stop. Yeah. And Australians absolutely love holidays. Yeah. So there is no doubt that that's part of the story here. There's a few... Yep, it feels like holiday time. Anyone else? Celebration. celebration, absolutely. Australians love to be able to celebrate. That is true. Food. food. Oh, praise God, food. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think this is all wrapped in it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, a other... Outside ourselves feeling, isn't there? Yes, yes, about, about that. There's something other than us. And I do think that that's really important. And I do think also what plays into this, and this is what tradition's meant to invoke in us in some ways, is nostalgia. Yeah, the idea of nostalgia, that we remember, we remember what it was like as a kid, or we remember, and quite often we remember, our brains are usually pretty good at throwing out the bad stuff and keeping the good. If it's trauma related, maybe not so much, but usually it remembers the good. You remember as a kid, you remember those feelings. And so when we see something, and that's why Christmas movies, yeah, people want to watch them again and again because they want to remember the feelings, they remember what it's like. There's a tradition to that. So how does that fit in with the idea of our country becoming more and more households with less and less people in them. You know, we have, we have, the amount of people to households is actually, if we split it up, there's one and a half people to every house. Yeah. That's crazy statistic, isn't it? There's one and a half people. What does that mean? Yes, it does mean that there's houses with a family in it, but that does mean that there's a lot of households where there's a one. Yeah? And so when we talk about these things, we've talked about all of Christmas. If you think about every single thing we talked about, it's actually because it's about being together. It's about being with other people. In fact, probably even the stuff that we don't like about Christmas, probably be together and be with other people. But I actually think there's, I wonder, there's not many spaces left anymore that, were, that people actually do want to get together. They do want to be, feel like they're a part of something bigger than themselves. Because lots of the rest of our society is pushing us into being by ourselves, And it's actually a recognised problem in the first world. A recognised problem of social anxiety and loneliness are two massive issues. So Christmas speaks to that. But more so that we know behind that story, and this is the frustration sometimes some of us might feel of, well, behind this story is something that the world needs and wants and they don't even realise it. And it is this hope and peace. It is the fact that our hope is in him who promises to set things right. So our hope isn't just that he has come, as I was talking about before, it's actually that Jesus is coming back again. Our hope is that, like it's spoken in Isaiah, that we hope that Jesus would come, that the Messiah would come to set about a new kingdom, a kingdom of peace 
and hope and joy and love and forgiveness. And that's what he did. That's why we celebrate. We don't celebrate... We celebrate a baby because of what a baby means. Like Mark was saying about Simeon. We celebrate a baby coming that Jesus... That God sent his son to be with us, but also to set his kingdom in place. That will actually when he comes again, we'll set it completely right. We'll set it completely right. This is what Isaiah says. Think about this. This is written hundreds of years before Jesus comes and still relevant to us. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. Whoa, let's not speak into a second mic. <laughs> and the government shall be upon his shoulder... And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And the throne of David and over his kingdom. That was realised in Jesus. We know these words, don't we? We use these words to explain Jesus. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I like these words of the increase of the government and of peace. There will be no end. Jesus brought a kingdom in place that will be of no end, but will be fully realised when he comes back again. So it's our role in this story is to proclaim this good news, this hope and peace for the world that might not be fully realised yet, but will be. That's the bit that will be, there will be no end that we can sing songs in that space. That our hope is this whole story. The Advent, when we think and prepare and we wait, because we are part of this longer story. Yeah? It's a big, big story, an overarching story of the whole of history. The whole of history from creation to fulfilment of a new heaven and a new earth. That this is the full story. We know this. God has revealed this to us and it's wonderful. And we are here in the story. Yeah, three quarters of the way through. That's interesting in itself, isn't it? Because we need to live in that moment. Because our story is unfold. Our hope doesn't come, it's for the future. Yet yeah, nostalgia, when we talk about that's the danger of nostalgia is we can just wish it was like it always was. Does, does that make sense? The danger of nostalgia can be we can be miss out on what God's doing now and wants to do. Has anyone felt that before? Sensed and seen the world and went, oh, why can't it be like this? Old people can definitely feel like this. When I look at, even when I think of sport, See, unfortunately, sport's my little framework. But I can have and think, oh, why can't it be like it used to be with sport? Yeah? And nostalgia and think, oh, why can't... And there's probably elements that I still wonder that. But if I'm not careful, I can allow that to be bitter and miss out on what's happening right now and enjoy what's happening now. It's that same idea. If we just worry about, oh, why can't it be like before? Why can't Australia be like it was? But actually realise, or Gawla, or Gawla Baptist, but realise God's doing something now because his hope is that all would come to know him. And our hope is in who? Him. Him. Not our circumstances, not what's going on in our families, not going on in work, but our hope is in him. Because this is the truth of this. Our hope isn't in things or even in the fact that God's going to make it better. It's actually in him. It's his past faithful, faithfulness to us. It's the, this character of who he is that actually our hope comes. Why do you understand that? I know that sounds a nuance because it's not in things. It's actually in a person. Yeah. So God has revealed himself to us. You can probably think back to moments where he's been faithful. And that is the thing we can hold on to, that we can know he is going to be faithful. That's what faith looks like and that's what hope looks like together and how it interacts. 
Because this redemption, Jesus coming down, is the proof of hope coming. It's the proof of hope coming. Psalm 39, 7 talks about, But now, Lord, who do I look for? My hope is in the future. No, it's in him. Our hope is in a person. Our hope is in Jesus. Our hope is in Yahweh. And that's where he'd want us to interact with him. Not just in our circumstances, but in the person. God doesn't need us to interact with him so things can be set right. We need him. Does that make sense? We can sometimes get in that weird space where, oh, God needs, or oh, I need that. He needs us to do something. He doesn't need us. We need him. We need him. And that's the only reason that God wants us. It's not out of his selfish ambition that everyone would worship him. It's actually for our benefit. So that we would know his peace, his love, his hope, his joy. In two words, it's really interesting in this verse. For now, who, who, Lord, who do I look for? The longer it says, where do, I find my peace? where do I find my hope? My hope is in you. There's two words that gets used, and there's actually two words that are different types of hope. Kaval and Yakal are two words that get, get used for hope. And in that verse, it's connecting these two ideas that our hope is not just, our hope is future, but our hope is present. And Kaval and, and Yakal are present tense, future tense. We know that hope is a future thing. But our hope isn't just about what's coming. Our hope is meant to be for right now. Right now. So we trust in his character. We trust in the fact that he has, in our life, been there when we've needed him. Sometimes I get it though, it sometimes feels like in this moment that sometimes he's not there because the world is broken and it doesn't make sense and it doesn't always go the way we'd want it to. But we need to hold on to the character of the fact that he is God and he will set things right. He will set things right. I want to play a song for you now. Um from a band it's actually some of the guys that I used to go to church with back uh, you heard me reference down Seaview I went to a church down south and we ran a I guess it was a ministry for the music scene in Adelaide punk hardcore music scene that time we saw young people wanting to express their faith in their music and were playing pubs and clubs around the place and these guys had got, um, got a record deal and were played on Triple J but their words and their songs were all about their faith and how that displayed. And sometimes the words were um, elusive in trying to find that and some of them were more explicit because they wanted to use that and speak into, uh, they wanted to speak into a generation, into a place of God's goodness and, and God's forgiveness. I wanted to play this song because when I think of hope, I think of this song and I think it's wrapped up this song speaks to hope in a really amazing way. So I'm going to put the words up and I'm hoping that Paul's going to play the song for you. And hopefully, if you can't understand the words from the song, I'm hoping that I can play along for you. Sorry, guys. I thought we could play the, show the words and the song at the same time. So let me just quickly go through some of the words before we play the song. Yep. Do you notice it? Even if I could, I wouldn't change the beauty of this faith I have in you. And childhood we dreams withstood, even though we can't sustain ourselves to see this through. So I choose to stand with you, right beside you singing, and I wait upon the day when we all will be crowned kings. And it just may be, this is why we sing, for the hope of joy everlasting. And now once we once stood, impressions of the step I took to finally reach you, and you gave all you could, even though we can't sustain ourselves to see this through. He said, when fear tears down, 
strength can be found. And it's almost over now. And I can't speed the day. I'm going to wait because I choose to stand with you right beside you singing as we wait upon the day where we all be crowned kings. I love the words in this. I don't know why it's making me emotional, but I'm just... Because the emotions of this song, I love it, is that, that sense of why we sing. Why do we do this? Sometimes we wonder, we wonder what's this all about? But we sing to a God who actually embraces us and wants us with him. He wants us with him that we would understand that I choose to stand with you, God, because he wants us to be his little kings and queens and prince and princesses in his kingdom, the people who stand for things that matter, the things that matter of hope and joy and love and peace, the things that we know matter. And he calls us into that place. And we have to wait. We want that day to happen. I love the, I can't speed the day, but I'm going to wait. And I choose to stand with you singing. Because we can't wait for that day. That day when we can't sustain ourselves. Holding that tension of realising we can't do this ourselves and we need him. Yeah? Sorry. We'll play the song. Thanks, Paul. And even if I could. We used to sing this song, actually, 
at, at church, uh, at, at, at the church down CV. Um, and guys, some of you might know Jeremy, Jeremy Wright, which is actually do the works at Cedar now. And um, I don't know if you're here in the background, but there's this guttural scream. You probably can't hear because it's actually back in the mix. But when we sung it live, he would be on his bass screaming that, which is right at that moment of sing, which for you, some of you people think scream, sing, that makes no sense. But it's that it always meant something to me because it felt like a, a cry out to God, that cry out of we need him. We need him to show up. That is the hope. This is why we sing. That is the hope we hold. We hold a hope that is desperate to get out, guys. It is desperate. And if we grab and capture that, yeah, it will come out of you and people will see it and make a difference in this world. I really do believe that. Let me pray as so we're going to finish the service with the song. Because we sing. We sing of our hope. Lord God, thank you for the chance to be together, for the chance to be reminded that our hope is in you, Jesus. Our hope is in a baby that came to earth in need, but also not that held all that we need. God, thank you for that. Thank you our hope is in you. I just ask that you would help us carry that hope in our own lives, and to others. In Jesus' name. Amen.